Hello, my name is Håkon and welcome back all you fabulous fighting fantasy aficionados for finally yet another episode of fighting fantasy gamebook play. It has been a few weeks now, I've been doing lots of other things, uh, mostly to do with music. If, uh, if anyone's been paying attention to my channel they would have noticed that. Uh, I know lots of you are here for just for the music. I know lots of my viewers are just here for, for other stuff. So uh, I'm trying to cater to everyone. So it's hard to do everything all at once. Now, <clears throat> last time I finished playing uh, City of Thieves. Um, and I was actually planning to do an Aftermath episode, which I usually do when I finish playing a book, which means I map out the entire book and I analyze it, I find out find out what the chances are of winning, etc. Um, I find mistakes in the book and I still haven't done that with this book. Um, I just haven't got around to because the main thing I have to do before I can do any analysis is to make a complete map and I just haven't got around to it yet. It does take quite a bit of time. I will do it eventually but before I start doing that, I will I will actually start playing the next one, which is Death Trap Dungeon. And I know lots of people have been looking forward to this, myself included, um, because this is one of the most popular ones, one of the best-selling books of that year, I believe, as well. Um, in uh, what year was that again? 1984. So this is first reprint, 1984, still before the green spine editions. This has a lovely blue that's of course based on the blue in the cover art and I think that looks really snazzy. Um, so yeah, Death Trap Dungeon. Um, it's gonna be very exciting. I know I had this book when I was younger. Uh, I can't remember having played it much. Um, it's another of those and uh, in fact, I think most of the fighting fantasy game books I had, I didn't play them much. I would have sort of started playing most of them at some point, but it sort of fizzled out a little bit. And um, I've played them a lot more now altogether than I did back then, I think. Um, so, Death Trap Dungeon. Let's just get into it. So I'll be uh, getting my things ready on my desk and I'll be with you in a moment. Right, so here we are, Death Trap Dungeon. Uh, I've got my book, got my blank pad that I use for my character sheets, got my pens, paper, dice, got my cup of tea. Ah, yummy. Um, got some water as well because usually I get rather thirsty with all this talking. And uh, I don't know what it is. I'm still, I'm still one of my sort of major theory is, is that I am getting starting to get sensitive to some kind of pollen or other uh, that is causing me to sort of <clears throat> cough and get a bit mucusy in the mornings and things. So please bear with me and I do try to edit out the worst ones uh, sometimes but sometimes I also miss them so uh, my apologies in advance. Uh, right so Death Trap Dead, I haven't opened this one yet now oh, properly I've had a look. Uh, so let's find out if there are any special rules in this one. So first my initial scores. So <clears throat> we've got skill, stamina and luck. And let's see, and it's a usual thing, skill one Die plus six, twelve. I think that might be useful. Uh, stamina, eight plus twelve. That's twenty. And luck. Uh, oh my, that's a bit much actually. Okay, so, um, so really good stats to start with. Although usually it's not the stats that kill me, or the stats that make you die in these ones. You end up in a some kind of trap or other where. Your yeah, your abilities are simply not going to save you. You make a wrong decision, and that is you. Um, let's see, escaping is the usual thing. Using luck in battles, all standard. So using provisions, it says here. Uh -huh. <clears throat> 
looks like we have provisions here. So equipment and potions. Oh, as usual, you can choose a potion. <clears throat> Skill, strength of fortune. Um, let's see, you've got one use of a potion. It doesn't look like you have any starting provisions. If I'm reading this correctly now. So even though the rules here are standard and they mentioned provisions, it uh, doesn't seem to be <clears throat> any mention of having any. Anyway, I usually as usual, I will go with my potion of strength or portion of stamina as I prefer to call it to avoid any confusion uh, and that's single use and uh, which will restore my uh, stamina to full score at any point uh, well, hang on uh, but not in battle so <clears throat> that was only in was it the, only in the first in the in fight of mountain Wolok of fight of mountain i believe that it didn't say that it couldn't be used in battle it's at any time but after that it looks like the rules are you can use them but not in battle mm. um, but i was just checking here Well, I suppose it is in keeping with the scenario <clears throat> of this particular book that you don't have any provisions. Mm. Actually, there's a bit of sort of cut and paste weirdness here because it says your backpack contains provisions um, for the trip. But it's not really a trip, is it? So much as a contest in this case. Um, Trial of Champions is what you are going to do in this one. And so now I'm just looking and looking now and I can't see there's any mention of having any provisions, even though it says quite clearly how to use them. Uh, oh, and actually it says there, okay, that it was sort of a bit hard to find out. Your backpack contains enough provisions for 10 meals. Okay, so we do have provisions. Um, 10, okay. And each provision you can restore for points of stamina okay <clears throat> now let's get to the background after another sip of tea despite its name <clears throat> excuse me hmm. Despite its name, Fang was an ordinary small town in the northern province of Chiang Mai. Situated on the banks of the River Kok, it made a convenient stopover for river traders and passengers throughout most of the year. And I believe some of the names here are uh, inspired by, or actually directly taken from, a Thailand where Ian Livingstone went on holiday at some point. Around this time, actually, so that's where he got the names from. Chiang Mai is in, in Thailand, uh, maybe Fang is as well, possibly. River Kok, I presume, as well. Um, um, a few barges, rafts, and sometimes even a large sailboat could usually be found moored at Fang. But all that was long, all that was long ago, before the creation of the Trial of Champions. Now, once a year, the river is crammed with boats as people arrive from hundreds of miles around, hoping to witness the breaking of an ancient tradition in Fang and Sea of Victor and the Trial of Champions. On the 1st of May each year, warriors and heroes come to Fang to face the test of their lives. Survival is unlikely, yet many take the risk, for the prize is great. A purse of 10,000 gold pieces and the freedom of Chiang Mai forever. So, if you're after the money, I suppose. However, to become champion is no easy task. Some years ago, a powerful baron of Fang called Sukhumvit decided to bring attention to his town by creating the ultimate contest. With the help of the townspeople, he constructed a labyrinth deep in the hillside behind Fang, from which there was only one exit. The labyrinth was filled with all kinds of deadly tricks and traps and loathsome monsters. 
Sukhumvit had designed it in a meticulous detail so that anybody hoping to face its challenge would have to use their wits as well as weapon skill. When he was finally satisfied that all was complete, he put his labyrinth to the test. He picked ten of his finest guards and, fully armed, they marched into the labyrinth. They were never seen again. The tale of the ill-fated guards soon spread throughout the land, and it was then that Sukhumvit announced the first trial of champions. Messengers and news sheets carried <clears throat> excuse me, his challenge, 10,000 gold pieces and the freedom of Chiang Mai forever to any person surviving the perils of the labyrinth of Fang. The first year, 17 brave warriors attempted the walk, as it later became to be known, later came to be known. Not one reappeared. As the years passed and the trial of champions continued, it attracted more and more challengers and spectators. Pang prospered and would prepare itself months in advance for the spectacle it hosted each May. The town would be decorated, tents erected, dining halls built, musicians, dancers, fire eaters, illusionists and every sort of entertainer hired, and entries registered from hopeful individuals intent on making of the walk. The last week of April found the people of Fang and its visitors in wild celebration. Everybody sang, drank, danced and laughed until day broke on 1st of May, when the town thronged to the gates of the labyrinth to watch the first challenger of the year step forward to face the trial of champions. Um, I just must say something now because it doesn't make any sense whatsoever that this world uses the same names of the month as we do because our names of the month are of course from uh, based on, on, on Latin or Roman, Roman mythology mostly <laughs> and the Roman calendar. They wouldn't have the Gregorian or Julian calendars in Alancia, would they? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever, so they should have had their own months. Um, yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> of course I would have required... Um, actually, it wouldn't have required. You wouldn't have had to, to mention the names of the month. You could just say, oh, the first, um, first of May, so you could say, oh, one week after the spring equinox. Um... For instance, you still have weeks, you still have equinoxes, I suppose. Um, so yeah, <clears throat> anyway, yeah, May and April, doesn't make any sense. Having seen one of Sukhumvit's challenges nailed to a tree, you decide that this year you will attempt the walk. For the last five years you have been attracted to it, not for the rewards, but for the simple fact that nobody has ever yet emerged victorious from the labyrinth, which will tell you something. <laughs> Uh, you intend to make this year in which a champ this the year in which a champion is crowned, gathering up a few belongings to set off immediately. Two days' walk takes you west to the coast, where you enter the cursed port Black Sand. Wasting no time in that city of thieves, you buy a passage on a small boat sailing north to where the river Cock meets the sea, and from there you take a raft upriver for four days until finally you arrive in Fang. The trial begins in three days' time, and the town is in an almost hysterical mood of excitement. You register your entry with the officials and are given a violet scarf to tie around your arm, informing everyone of your status. For three days you enjoy Fang's greatest hospitality and are treated like a demigod. During the long merriment you almost forget your purpose in Fang, but the evening before the trial the magnitude of the task ahead begins to dominate your thoughts. Later, you are taken to a special guest house and shown to your room. There is a splendid four-poster bed with satin sheets to help you rest, but there is little time left for sleep. Just before dawn, a trumpet call awakens you from vivid dreams of flaming pits and giant black spiders. Minutes later, there is a knock on your door and a man's voice rings out, saying, Your challenge begins soon. Please be ready to leave in ten minutes. You climb out of bed, walk over to the window, and open the shutters. Already people are thronging the streets, moving quietly through the morning mist. Spectators on their way to the labyrinth, no doubt, hoping to find good vantage points on which to watch the competitors. You turn away and walk over to a wooden table on which you, your trusty sword lies. You pick it up and cut the air with a mighty sweep, wondering what beasts its sharp edge may soon have to meet. Then you open the door into the corridor. A small man with slanted eyes greet, greets you with a low bow as you emerge from your bedroom. Please follow me, he says. 
He turns to his left and walks quickly toward, towards the stairs at the end of the corridor. Leaving your guest house, he darts down narrow alleyways between houses and you have to walk quickly to keep up with him. Soon you come into a wide dirt road line with cheering crowds. When they see your violet scarf, they cheer even louder and start showering you with flowers. The long shadows cast by the people in front of you shrink as the bright yellow sun rises higher in the morning sky. Standing there in front of the noisy and vibrant crowd, you feel strangely alone, aware of your coming ordeal. Suddenly you feel a tug on your shirt and see a small guide eagerly beckoning you to follow him. Ahead, you see the looming hillside and the dark mouth of a tunnel disappearing into its inner depths. As you get closer, closer you notice two great stone pillars on either side of the tunnel entrance. The pillars are covered with ornate carvings, writhing serpents, demons, deities, each seeming to scream a silent warning to those who would pass beyond them. You see Baron circumvent himself, standing by the entrance, waiting to greet the contenders in the trial of champions. You count five others standing proudly in line. The violet scarves displayed for all to see. There are two bare-chested barbarians dressed in furs. They stand completely motionless, legs straight and slightly apart, arms thrust forward to rest on the hilts of their long double-headed battle axes. A sleek elven woman with golden hair and feline green eyes is adjusting the crossbelt of daggers wrapped around her leather tunic. Of the two remaining men, one is covered from head to foot in iron plate armour with a plumed helmet and a crested shield. The other is cloaked in black robes, only his dark eyes showing between the swathes of his black face scarves. Long knives, a wire garrote and other silent death weapons hang from his belt. The five contenders acknowledge your arrival with almost imperceptible nods of the head. And you turn to face the exultant crowd for the last time. Suddenly, a hush falls over the crowd as Baron Sukovich steps forward, holding six bamboo sticks. You draw one from his outstretched hand and read the word fifth. Then the trial begins. So here are my other other people trying to fight now. There's um, two barbarians over here, the elven lady, the armed warrior, and the assassin guy here. And uh, Baron Sukhumvit, I presume, here. So, yeah. The knight is first. He salutes the crowd before disappearing into the tunnel, and is followed half an hour later by the elf. Next goes the barbarian, and then the dark assassin. Now it is your turn to salute the crowd. Holding your violet scarf aloft, you take one final deep breath of cool, fresh air before turning to pass between the stone-pillared gateway into Sukhumvit's corridors of power to face unknown perils on the walk through the mighty Baron's death trap dungeon. Now turn over, and if you'll excuse me just a moment, because I need to blow my nose. So I'll be right back. Right, I'm back. Uh, okay, so let's get started. Um, paragraph one. Always exciting. Okay, so uh, let's see character sheet. Get my map out here, maybe. So it's on the side of there oh. and paragraph one and this is i'll just put ff6 isn't it yes ff6 the clamor of the excited spectators gradually fades behind you as you venture deep into the gloom of the cavern tunnel large crystals hang from the tunnel roof at 20 meter intervals radiating a soft light just enough for you to see your way as your eyes gradually become accustomed to the near darkness, you begin to see movement all around. Spiders and beetles crawling up and down the chiseled walls disappear quickly into cracks and crevices as they sense your approach. Rats and mice scurry along the floor ahead of you. Droplets of water drip into small pools with an eerie plopping sound which echoes down the tunnel. The air is cold, moist and dank. After walking slowly along the tunnel for about five minutes, you arrive at a stone table standing against the wall to your left. On it there are six boxes, one of which has your name painted on its lid. 
you wish to open the box, turn to 270. If you prefer to continue walking north, turn to 66. So, now, a box with your name on it, surely they wouldn't put something in there that would... Uh, that would kill you, would they? That would be too mean, surely. Maybe this is the first trap. Now there's a piece of information missing here. It doesn't tell me whether the other, other boxes have been opened or not. Um, I'll open the box. The lid of the box lifts off easily. Inside you find two gold pieces. Let's see, gold. I'm not sure if I started with any gold this time. I didn't actually double check that, but... Um, and a note written on a small piece of parchment addressed to you. After placing the gold in your pocket, you read the message, which says, Well done. At least you have the sense to stop and take advantage of the token aid given to you. Now I can advise you that you will need to find and use several items if you hope to pass triumphantly through my death trap dungeon. Signed, Circumpit. That was very helpful. I'm going to need lots of items to get it get through. Well, duh, I suppose. Mm, excuse me. Um, memorizing the advice on the notes. That's so hard to memorize, isn't it? You tear it into tiny pieces and continue north along the tunnel. Turn to 66. So, um, that wasn't very helpful. Just two gold pieces, I guess. And the very obvious advice that you need to use items. Well, it isn't in Livingston book, so I suppose, uh, well, in a sort of meta sense of it, uh, at least you know already you're going to need lots of items. Um, right. So, turning to 66. After walking down the tunnel for a few minutes, you come to a junction. A white arrow painted on one wall points west. On the floor, you can see wet footprints made by those who entered before you. It's hard to be sure, but it looks as though three of them followed the direction of the arrow, while one decided to go east. So, if you wish to head west, turn to 293. If you wish to head east, turn to 119. So, we've got... Um, uh, east or west, so... 293, west... One, one, nine, east. Well, I'm going to head east because going where the arrow doesn't point can be a bit more exciting sometimes. Ahead, you can see a large obstruction on the tunnel, on the tunnel floor. Although it is too dark to make out exactly what it is, the wet footprints you have been following carry on towards the obstruction. If you want to continue east, turn to 56. Um, if you want to, if you'd rather go back to the junction and head west, turn to 293. So, okay, so 56, east again. I'm going to check out the obstruction, whatever that is now. See that the obstruction is a large brown boulder-like object. You touch it with your hand and are surprised to find that it is soft and spongy. If you wish to try to climb over it, turn to 373. If you wish to slice it open with your sword, turn to 215. Well, it could be a living thing, I suppose. But I'm not going to climb it. Um, so I think... Uh, so 373, climb, or 215, slice. I'm going to slice it open with my sword. Your sword easily pierces, oh I see. Your sword easily pierces the thin outer casing of the giant spore ball. A thick brown cloud of spores bursts out of the ball and envelops you. Some of the spores stick to your skin and start to itch terribly. Great lumps come up on your face and arms and your skin feels as if it is on fire. Lose two stamina points. OK. 
Okay, so stamina, 18. Um, frantically scratching your itching lumps, you step over the now deflated spore ball and head east to 13. So that probably wasn't the best decision, but it got me across without too much trouble. The tunnel makes a sudden turn to the left and heads north for as far as you can see. The footprints you are following start to peter out as the tunnel becomes gradually drier. Oh. Soon you are beyond the dripping roof and the pools on the floor. You notice the air becoming hotter and you find yourself panting even though you are walking quite slowly. In the small recess on the left hand wall you see a section of bamboo standing on its end. Lifting it down you see it is filled with a clear liquid. Your throat is painfully dry and you feel a little dizzy from the heat in the tunnel. You wish to drink the liquid, turn to 147. You do not want to risk drinking the liquid and would rather continue north, turn to 182. Also, why not to bring any water on these things? Um, so. So 147. Now, if some part of this tunnel is seems to be artificially hot, and there is something there to drink. That does sound like a trap to me. So I'm not going to drink that. I am going to continue north. Um, the temperature continues to rise and you find yourself dripping with sweat. As you struggle on, the heat intensifies until it feels like white heat and becomes so unbearable that you begin to pass out. If you drank the liquid from the bamboo pipe, turn to 25. If it did not stop to drink, turn to 242. Okay, so maybe I should have drunk <laughs> after all. Um, so, oops, it's the wrong color now. Um, Okay, so 242, 25, 25, drank or 242, didn't drink. So I didn't drink, so I'm going to 242. I'm fasting out probably. You shake your head, trying desperately to stop yourself from blacking out, but the heat is too much for you and you fall unconscious to the floor. Roll two dice. If the total is the same as or less than your skill, well, it will be regardless, um, turn to 48. If the total is greater than your skill, turn to 366. So we've got... Um, test skill. And... 48, success, Three sixty six fail. So <clears throat> I'm going to 48. Only your immense strength and grim determination keep you from falling unconscious to the floor. You grit your teeth and press on resolutely. Turn to 197. So 197, maybe if you failed a skill test there, that would have been the end of it. it wouldn't surprise me. Mercifully, the temperature now starts to drop rapidly and soon it feels almost cool again. On the left hand side of the tunnel is a closed door. It has a small iron plate in it, which might possibly slide open. Will you try to open the door, try to slide the iron plate, or continue north up the tunnel? So we have uh, three, two, six, north, um, one, five, six, iron plate, or one, seven, one, open door. Now, of course, now we've got a chance to actually have a look inside before you open the door, which is unusual. So I'm going to um, slide the iron plate. Of course, whatever is inside might then get a better warning that you're coming. A small plate slides open easily and you find yourself peering into a room with a deep 
pit in the floor behind the door. On the opposite wall there are two iron hooks, on one of which hangs a coil of rope. If you wish to open the door, jump over the pit and take the rope, turn to 208. If you would rather continue north along the tunnel, turn to 326. So, um, I'm going to... That's quite a lot of things to do in one thing, isn't it? I'm going to open the door, jump over the pit, and take the rope. So I'm going to 208. Um, get rope, I'll put there. Just like in good old text adventure speak. Get rope. Um, right, 208. The door swings open into the room and you step back and jump over the pit. You put the rope in your backpack and jump back over the pit to leave the room and head north. I suppose if you just open the door you might fall into the pit or you have to do a test to see if you fall into the pit. So now I've got one rope. The big question now is how long is the length of rope? Anyway, so 326. I am going 326. There we are. Ahead, you see that the tunnel turns sharply to the left. You turn the corner and almost bump straight into two fierce-looking orcs, armed with morning stars and wearing leather armour. You are totally unprepared, and as you draw your sword, one of them swings its morning star at you. Roll one die. If you roll a one or two, turn to 91. If you roll three or four, turn to one. Okay, that's quite a lot of different options. I'll just put my... start mapping that out. Uh, okay, so we've got 91, 189, or 380, as we roll 1d6, and it's 1, 2, and 3, 4, or 5, 6. And a very nice picture there, although of course that is not a morning star, that is a flail. And, uh, and most likely those never really, yeah... Not very useful weapons if you're not on horseback. Um, quite likely to injure yourself. Anyway. A morning star is actually just a club with a spiked with a spiked ball at the end. Anyway. That doesn't matter so much. It's it's those things they're using anyway, so that's the main thing. So we have uh oh one die. And I don't know whether I'm supposed to roll high or low now, so, um, yeah. Rolling a three. Um, so I'm turning to 189. The Orc's Morning Star sinks agonizingly into your left thigh. Lose three stamina points. So I'm down to 15. You stagger toward backwards but manage to regain your balance in time to defend yourself. Fortunately, the tunnel is too narrow for both Orcs to attack you at once. Fight them one at a time. So here we are. And we've got. So <clears throat> I am at uh, twelve fifteen, and first orc is five five. Second orc is six four. So first one, I've got a skill advantage of seven, which is pretty good. So right, just to do the combat quickly. Um, Combat is as follows, normal combat, just one-to-one, -one, which is this, this just two one-to-one -one combats. Uh, you roll two dice and you add it to the skill of your opponent. Um, that's his attack roll and you do the same for yourself. You roll two dice and you add it to your skill. And the one that has the highest is the one that inflicts damage on the other and does two points of damage. If it is equal, nobody gets injured because you're just blocking each other's attacks. And of course, if uh, the, my opponent has higher than me, I take two damage. So I'll lose two stamina points, or hit points as I like calling it when I'm in combat. So he rolls 10 and of course uh, I've, got a, I've got seven higher skill than him which means I need to roll three to three or more to be equal or better and if I roll a two he injures me. So uh, and I roll an eight which means he is the one taking the damage and he's down to three hit points. And again, so he rolls a 6, I roll a 10, he's down to 1, he rolls a 7, I roll a 7, and he is 
dead. Second one, I've got a six skill point advantage. Um, he rolls a five, I roll a seven, he's down to two hit points, he rolls an eight, and I roll an eleven, and he is dead, and I could have beaten almost anything with those rolls. Right. Mm. And, <clears throat> so, 189, let's see, that's um, stamina minus three, and then I'm going to... 257. And also I think it's probably time to eat a provision. So I'm up to gain regain four hit points. And my provisions is down to nine. And I'm going to 257. Inside one of the orcs pockets you find one gold piece and a hollow wooden tube you put your findings in your backpack and set off west so um hollow tube okay and i'm now up to three gold pieces well that's gold three like so much better um 164 turning west again okay so maybe i should let my map go a little bit west as well so one six four As you walk along, droplets of water again start falling from the tunnel ceiling. You see wet footprints made by the same boots that you followed earlier, heading west. The footprints lead to a closed iron door on the right-hand wall of the tunnel, but do not seem to go any further. You wish to open the door, turn to 299. I suppose at some point you might have to fight your opponents here as well. Um, so we've got the option of going west, which is 80. Three or opening the door. I'll just do that down there now. And two ninety-nine. Of course, I'm going to open the door. Oh, yeah, nice. There's my opponent there. The door opens into a large chamber where you are shocked to see one of your rivals, who has obviously met a sudden gory death. He is one of the barbarians, and he is impaled on several long iron spikes, which are fixed to a frame that has sprung out of the floor. Uh, that sprung out of the floor. A lot of rubbish and debris litter litters the floor, concealing a hidden trap wire which he must have stepped on and thus released the spike tray. On the far wall is an alcove in which you can see a silver goblet standing on a small wooden table. Will you walk over to search the barbarian, walk towards the alcove or close the door and continue west? So we've got... Um, so alcove 41, alcove um, 126, barbarian. And going back, so I'm going to search the barbarian. Um, no, barbarian, they don't have anything interesting. Um, I'm going to do the alcove first, and if I get the option of doing barbarian afterwards, I'll do that too. So checking out the alcove. You walk slowly over to the alcove, carefully checking the floor for any more hidden traps. You see that the goblet contains a sparkling red liquid. Will you drink the red liquid, leave the goblet, and search a barbarian, or leave the chamber? So, um... Ninety-eight. Now, I'm, of course, very curious in, in these uh, books, which is how you die, uh, but I'm going to drink the red liquid because I want to know what effect it has for future reference. Ah, oh, and I'm being careless now, aren't I? Lifting the goblet releases a sprung catch, and a dart shoots out of the wooden table leg. Test your luck. And I'm um, rolling 11. Of course, that's good enough because my luck is 12. And of course, when you test your luck, it goes down by a point, regardless of whether it's successful or not. So now it's 11 for the time being. Um, and I'm lucky, so I'm going to 105. Um, but let's see, test luck. So lucky, one lucky, and 105, and 235, okay, so I'm lucky and I go to 105. Your reflexes are sharp and you quickly jump aside. 
the dart whistles past only just missing you, and thuds into the opposite wall. You see the goblet lying on the floor and the red liquid running away in rivulets over the grey stone. At least the goblet may be of use. So you put it in your backpack. So now I've got a goblet. Um, if you have not done so already, you may walk back to search the barbarian. So I'll go back to, oops, that's the wrong one. Back to search the barbarian, 126. The pouch in the barbarian's belt is empty apart from some strange looking dried meat wrapped in cloth. Will you eat the dried meat? Leave the meat and walk over to the alcove or leave the chamber. Well, I wouldn't want to keep the meat, but um, I don't have any stamina to regain now, so I'm not going to eat the meat because the best case scenario is it actually regains me stamina, I guess. And worst case scenario, it poisons me. So I'm going to leave that now. Let's see. I'll just do, put up the option for that. 226 eat meat um, and then you can go to 41 or you can go to 83 so we have there, 83 the passage passage soon leads to a junction you notice more footprints on the floor possibly as many as three pairs heading north from the south passage so this is where we get back to uh, where whatever else you the other direction you could have gone in the beginning. So, 37. So it looks like in the beginning there are two different paths one can follow and this is the first chalk point afterwards. Okay. Next time I guess I'll have to go the left path to see where that goes. The passage opens out into a white cavern which is darker but much drier. Ahead, you see the footprints gradually fade, then disappear. There is a large idol in the centre of the cavern, standing approximately six metres high. It has jewelled eyes, each as big as your fist. There are two giant stuffed bird-like creatures standing on either side of the idol. Well, stuffed, it says, I think they're alive and just waiting for someone to go and climb the idol and try to take the jewels. Um... If you wish to climb the idol, take the jewels, turn to 351. Uh, if you wish to walk through the cavern to the tunnel in the opposite wall, turn to 239. So we have, okay, so uh, 239 go onwards and 351 take jewels. Well, no guts, no glory. I'm going to take the jewels because... Um, this is my first playthrough. I'm not expecting to win at all. I want to sort of try lots of things. Uh, it worked really well in, in City of Thieves because by the time I finished playing, I actually had quite a comprehensive map. I knew almost where everything was um, and I knew what to do. So I'm going to um, see what happens when I try to take the jewels and see the birds come alive most likely. So... Um... The idol is very smooth and will be difficult to climb. Do you have any rope? Yes, I do. So, um, so presumably you can only climb the idol if you take the eastern path like I did in the beginning. So, um, let's see, rope question mark. And so we got... Uh -huh. Three, nine, six, a rope. Or 186. No rope. Okay, so 396, I have rope. Have rope, will climb. You make the rope into a lasso, whirl it above your head and throw it at the idol's head, smiling happily as it falls around its neck. You then tighten the noose and start to climb, holding yourself up the rope. You are soon at the top of the idol, sitting on the bridge of its nose and holding on to the rope. You draw your sword and wonder which jeweled eye to prize out first. If you wish to prize out the left eye, turn to 151. If you wish to prize out the right, turn to 34. Okay, that is interesting. You're given a choice which one to do first, which means one of them is probably good and the other one is bad. Um, right, so. Um, hmm. 
like so, and 151 left and 34 right. And of course, there have been no hints as to which one might be the correct one now. Oh. And try the left one. As you touch the idol's emerald eye, you hear a creaking sound below you. Looking down, you are shocked to see the two, well, not really shocked, see the two stuffed birds flying off. Their wings flap in jerky movements. They didn't look like flying birds. Um, but they are soon above you and look set to attack. Fight the flying guardians one at a time, but reduce your skill by two during this combat because of your restricted position. Okay, this is actually quite a tough battle potentially okay so these guys have uh, one at a time it says so uh, let's see me for the sake of this combat i've got 10 19 because i've reduced skill and they've got eight eight and seven eight so not a big advantage uh, to me here so first one seven eight so i've got a three skill advantage i need to read roll three he needs to roll three better than me to get anywhere so um, he rolls 11 and I roll 5 so he hits me and I'm down to 17 he rolls 7 I roll 7 he's down to 6 he rolls 6 I roll 8 so he's down to 4 he rolls 9 I roll 2 so I'm down to 15 hit points he rolls 5 I roll 7 he's down to 2 he rolls 9, I roll 5, so I'm down to 13. He rolls 8, I roll 7, so he is dead. Second one, only 2 skill advantage. He rolls 10, I roll 11, he's down to 6. He rolls 7, I roll 10, he's down to 4. He rolls 4, I roll 5, he's down to 2 hit points, and finally, maybe, he rolled 6 and I roll 8, and he is also dead, and my stamina is down to 13. So I win and I go to 240. Okay, uh, okay so that was... One five one. Okay, so fight. I can put the details there, and I go to two hundred forty. You look down and see the crumpled bodies of the two flying guardians lying motionless on the floor. You start to prize out the idol's emerald eye with the tip of your sword. At last it comes free and you are surprised by its weight when it falls into your hand. Hoping it may be of use later, you put it in your backpack. So. Emerald eye. If you now wish to prize out the right eye, turn to 34. Um, okay, so. Now the question is... Is the left eye actually the only one you can get and, and the guardians would come up anyway? And is the right one the one that's going to kill you if you try to prize it out? I will try. Okay, so I'm going to try to prize out the right one as well. Not because I'm greedy, but because I'm curious. <laughs> that was right. Uh, it's going to kill you. You try to force the point of your sword under the emerald eye. Much to your surprise, the emerald shatters on contact, releasing a jet of poisonous gas straight into your face. The gas knocks you out and you release the rope, bounce down the idol and crash onto the stone floor. Your adventure ends here. Okay, so left eye is actually the right um, in this case. So this is death. Okay. <laughs> so there we have it. Uh, not a long first session playing this, but um, well, you have to just try things out to find out what happens. So I know uh, at least one thing I don't, um, I'm not going to do next time, of course. Um, so and if I ever need, uh, I'm going to take the left path next time to see what's going on over here. But um, 
But the thing is that if I need the emerald later, I'll know where to get it and I'll know to get the left one. So this is very useful information for me and it will save me time later to have done it in this way first of all. So, um, so I'll be back next time with another episode of Death Trap Dungeon. Um, and possibly before I do, I'm not sure when I do City of Thieves uh, Aftermath episode, but uh, I notice most people don't look at my Aftermath episodes. Most people actually, uh, they watch my playthrough episodes. So I suppose more people find those exciting. And um, there's not as much to say about City of Thieves as about some of the others, I think, because it's pretty straightforward. But I will still make one at some point. So, um... Thanks for now, thanks for watching, and uh, I will see you next time with more fighting fantasy fun in Death Trap Dungeon. Bye for now.